sometimes the right thing to do takes too much courage. So I think to do the right thing on the part of the Bears, it would mean everyone putting their jobs on the line. Now, the Bears are the franchise that passed on Patrick Mahomes. They took Mitchell Trubisky in the draft that Mahomes wound up being taken in. None of the human beings who made that decision are still employed by the Bears. But I, on some level, it kind of still sticks to the organization. And the courage it would take to be the team that passes on Caleb Williams, assuming the Bears get the first pick, which if you watched Carolina play yesterday, they're most oh. certainly going to do. Oh, my God. <laughs> like Carolina is the least competitive team in the NFL. The way Carolina played yesterday, honestly, they would not win the CFP. Like, if you put Carolina in there with Alabama and Michigan, they would not win. This version of Drake, uh, Bray Sung would be like the third best quarterback. He oh. was 13 of 36. <laughs> At one point, I think he was like 3 of 20. Like, God. he built the, the, the 13 of 36 was like he padded those stats in yeah, the it was, second half. It was hand. garbage time completions. God. It really was. Like, the, their performance yesterday was the worst performance maybe by any team in the NFL this season, and that includes the game that Denver gave up 70. But let's not get sidetracked by that. The Bears are going to get that first pick. Here's what you're facing if you're them. You can either A, take the quarterback and thus have a rookie salary cap working on Caleb Williams, or B, sign Justin Fields, who is not in a position to demand Joe Burrow's contract or Herbert's or Mahomes or whoever. If you get him, I'm just making this up, for the Daniel Jones contract, and you trade away that first pick, you could get three ones and two twos and whatever it might be. And now you've got eight players on a rookie contract or whatever it is. You already have the good young offensive lineman you draft last year. You put Marvin Harrison out there. I'm just making him up opposite DJ Moore. And you get an offensive coach in there who has some idea which end zone it is we're trying to move the ball towards. And <laughs> Justin Fields is a star. I mean, he's so good, and they've made him so bad. I, 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 it's it's the gutsy decision because if Williams winds up being a star, then you get fired immediately. But I, I really genuinely think it would be the right call. You shouldn't be able to buy a championship in professional sports. It doesn't make any sense. I have been saying this forever. Back when Bud Selig was getting criticized, Bud Selig, who did more good things for baseball than he ever gets credit for, by the way, and revenue sharing was a thousand percent one of them. Back when Bud Selig was getting all this pushback on revenue sharing, I was the one who was standing there saying, you have to have this. There is no earthly reason why my parents, they owned a tiny little bookstore, right? We owned a, a, an independent bookstore in New York City. It was sort of a New York institution. People loved it. It was a family-owned business and it was great. And you know what happened? Barnes & Noble Superstores came in and they were selling the same exact books for a third of the price. And do you know what happened to my parents' store? It went out of business. Why? Because we weren't meant to compete with Barnes & Noble. But the Pirates, the Diamondbacks, and the Rays are meant to compete with the Dodgers, the Cubs, and the Yankees. They are. If you're not going to have them competing, then they shouldn't all be in the same league. Bud Selig finally solved this problem to the point that we've had the parody that you're talking about now, and they're trying to find a loophole to flex their financial muscle because they can't beat them fair and square at their own game. They can only outspend them, and I can't believe that you don't see it that way. But those teams that you just mentioned often beat those big market teams. They often do, and it's not as if now they do. It's not as if the the you know the Dodgers aren't paying any money here. They're paying forty six a year. You're telling me to be outraged over twenty four million dollars a year that they're not paying towards the competitive balance tax? I mean, to me, it feels like we're being outraged over something that's not all that outrageous. I mean, I yes, it's a it's candidly it's a bad look. I didn't even know that this was a stipulation in the CBA that you could circumvent because no one really has, at least not close to this extent. But it's not going to make a massive difference in baseball's competitive balance tax issue, nor is it going to set up a precedent because no other player is going to be willing to defer like 95% of his contract because they're not making $50 million a year off the field either. So what you're asking the official to do then is not to make a call in the final two minutes, let's say, of a close NFL game if that call that you are making clearly does not have an impact on the play, which is to say... At no point in the game, at no point in any circumstance, regardless of what's being run, 
could Kadarius Toney being lined up six inches off sides have an impact on the play? Sometimes you'll see a game, you'll see a play, and you'll see defensive holding or even offensive holding that takes place so far away from where the action is that you say it had no effect on the game, on the play. Just don't call that. And I understand the emotion of saying that. But at the end of the day, if we were to apply the slippery slope theory, we eventually arrive at the place where we realize we cannot do that. We cannot ask these officials, who already are overwhelmed by 106 of the most athletic people on, on planet Earth doing things that are fast and violent and furious and all within an inch of the line on every single play, we cannot ask them to predetermine which ones they are and aren't going to call. We just can't do it. So every part of me hates that that call is made. But I cannot blame the officials. I can't do it. I cannot ask that line judge whose job it is to look down the line and see if anyone is lined up off sides and if they are, throw the flag. I can't ask that guy to say, well, in the final minute and 20 of a close game, I'm not doing it. I can't do that. That can't be okay. It's just not something we can expect. When you're LeBron James, it don't make a damn bit of difference if you are the greatest basketball player that ever lived or how rich you are or how famous you are, or how powerful you are. When something is really, really wrong with your kid, that is the scariest, loneliest place in the entire world. And you know what they went through with their son, Bronny. And so for him to come back and play in a game yesterday, and I, they wound up, I think, losing the game. That didn't make a damn bit of difference. And he had a chase down block and made a three. And none of that matters either. Just seeing LeBron and his whole family walk in there, holding hands and watching their kid play, it genuinely choked me up. It choked me up as a dad. You'll know this someday, Hembo. And, and any, any of us who are parents, I think, know this. Like, that's the scariest thing I can ever imagine. Like to get a phone call, I don't even want to read, I don't want to go through it. We all know what happened with Bronny. To get a phone call like that and, and to have to live through whatever uncertainty they had to live through for however long they did and all the rest of that, like that is a position I th literally thank God I've never been in and I hope I never am. And all parents do hope that. Um, so I just wanted to say that yesterday, you know, like the, the, in that moment, like, he was just a dad. Like, he's just a dad going to see his kid play basketball, um, having lived through about the scariest thing you can live through. So, I don't know. I felt like saying that out loud. Um, sometimes I think we've, we lose sight of the humanity of these people because they're so famous and they're so successful and they're so powerful. But at the end of the day, um, it, it Success, wealth, and fame don't change everything. They change a lot of things, but they didn't change that.